Hey everyone, looks like we've got another packed house for our deep dive today. Always a good sign. Definitely. And, uh, well, it seems like a lot of you are thirsty for some of that sweet, sweet wisdom on a topic that can really make or break your portfolio. When to sell a stock? Yeah, it's one of those things that nobody really wants to talk about. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Selling. Who wants to sell? We want to buy and hold forever, right? Right. But, uh, well, the reality is that knowing when to sell is just as crucial as knowing when to buy. Absolutely. And who better to guide us through this investing labyrinth than the Oracle of Omaha himself, Mr. Warren Buffett? If we're talking investing legends, he's certainly top of the list. For sure. So to get into the nitty gritty, we're taking a deep dive into this video today from the Swedish investor. They do a phenomenal job of breaking down Buffett's approach to selling using, get this, his own words. I've seen this one. It's packed with those classic Buffettisms, witty, insightful, and surprisingly applicable. Seriously. Yeah. And one of the first things that really jumped out at me was how much our own psychology, our emotions, can sabotage our returns when it comes to hitting that sell button. Yeah, it's so easy to get emotionally attached to our stocks. Right, like there are babies or something. It's like we forget that a stock certificate isn't a cuddly pet. Exactly. And Buffett, he just cuts right through that noise. He says, uh, hold on, I wrote it down here somewhere. Ah, here it is. It. The stock doesn't give a damn. A stock at 50, somebody's paid 100, they feel terrible. Somebody else paid 10, they feel wonderful. All these feelings, and it has no impact whatsoever. Classic Buffett. Yeah. He has a way of just putting things so plainly. Right. It's like a punch to the gut of our emotional biases, oh, yeah. but in a good way, you know. Totally. He's reminding us that the stock doesn't care what we paid for it. It's got no clue. And frankly, it doesn't care. It's all about the fundamentals of the business, the future potential. And our job as investors is to detach from those feelings and look at our holdings objectively, just like Buffett does. Exactly. Evaluate the business, not the buy-in price. Now, with that emotional detachment firmly in place, let's let's unpack the scenarios where even Buffett would think about selling a stock. Because yes, even he sells sometimes. He's not just buying companies and locking them away in a vault forever, although it sometimes seems that way. Haha, <laughs> right. But there's a method to his madness, and the Swedish investor breaks it down beautifully. So scenario number one, when you find something even better. Ah, uh, the classic case of opportunity cost rearing its head. Opportunity cost. It sounds so formal, but really it's something we grapple with every day, right? Totally. Like imagine you're at a decent restaurant enjoying your meal, but then you spot an amazing restaurant across the street. What do you do? Ooh, tough one. Okay, I'm picturing this amazing Italian place I love, but across the street, Oh, man, it's that new ramen spot everyone's raving about. And it's got your name on it, right? Ugh, this is a dilemma. Exactly. You're already invested in your current meal, but this new opportunity, it's just too good to pass up. You're making me hungry, but okay, yes, I see what you're getting at. It's about maximizing your dining experience, just like Buffett wants to maximize his investment returns. Got it. So how does this culinary analogy apply to our portfolios? Well, think of it this way. The Swedish investor gave a great example. They said Buffett would gladly sell a company at three times earnings if it meant he could buy another one at two times earnings. Wow. So even if he likes the first company, if there's a better deal out there. He's going to go for it. Remember, it's not personal. It's business. Not personal, Sonny. It's strictly business. Didn't he actually say that once? He did. And it perfectly captures his mindset, particularly earlier in his career when he was managing those partnerships. Ah, so there's a difference between how Buffett operated back then and how he invests now through Berkshire Hathaway. I'm sensing some nuance here. You're sharp. And that nuance is super important for us to understand because it highlights how his buy and hold forever philosophy, which he's become so famous for, might not translate perfectly for individual investors like you and me. Okay, now I'm really intrigued. So how does this difference in constraints between, say, Buffett managing billions through Berkshire and us managing our own portfolios, how does that impact how we approach this finding something better scenario? Well, it's like this. Today, Buffett's more likely to hold on to an entire company indefinitely, especially those with strong management teams, people he trusts and respects. He's even said that selling one of those companies would be like selling one of my children. It goes beyond just the numbers for him at this point. Yeah, I can see that. It's like he's built this family of businesses and he's in it for the long haul with them. But I can also see how that approach, while amazing for Buffett, might not always be practical for individual investors like me who you know, aren't running a massive holding company. 
Exactly. We might need to be a bit more nimble, a bit more responsive to changing market conditions. And that actually leads us really well into Buffett's second reason to sell a stock. When the underlying reasons you bought it in the first place, they're just gone. Okay, so we're talking about more than just your average market dip or some short-term volatility. Right? right. This is about recognizing a fundamental shift in the business or the whole industry, something that permanently alters its trajectory. So basically when the whole game changes. Exactly. And the Swedish investor video does a great job of illustrating this with some real world examples from Buffett's own track record. Like remember when he sold all his airline stocks back in 2020? Oh, right. Right at the beginning of the pandemic. Exactly. It was a classic case of the pandemic completely upending the entire economics of an industry basically over overnight. Talk about a curveball. Mm -hmm. And I think, didn't he also sell his stake in the Washington Post a while back? He did back in 2014. And that was after years, literally years of him openly talking about how the print media landscape was changing and not really in a good way. He knew those competitive advantages the Post had enjoyed for so long they were fading away and he decided to cut his losses. Wow. So even Buffett, the Oracle himself, makes tough calls like that. Yeah. Sometimes you have to let go of those sentimental holdings, even if they hold like a special place in your portfolio. It's true, and it's something a lot of investors struggle with, getting attached to those forever stocks. But that's why I think Buffett's wisdom here is so crucial. He stresses that selling based on those knee-jerk reactions to scary news, that's almost always a bad idea. It's about really digging deep and figuring out if it's just a temporary setback or a true signal that a company's prospects have fundamentally changed. So it's about differentiating between a dip and a disaster. Exactly. Yeah. Easier said than done, I know. For sure. It takes a lot of discipline to stay calm under pressure and really try to analyze the situation objectively. Absolutely. It's one of those easier said than done things for sure. But speaking of discipline and saying objective, are you ready for Buffett's third big reason to sell? This one might throw you for a loop. Hit me with it. I'm ready for anything at this point. Okay, so this one is about when a single holding, one single stock, grows too large for your portfolio, like really big. Hmm. That's interesting. It makes me think of that age-old advice, don't put all your eggs in one basket. But isn't Buffett famous for, like, his concentrated bets, I thought that was his whole thing. It is. He's a big proponent of building a focused portfolio, a small number of stocks that you really believe in. But, and this is a big but, the Swedish investor points out that even Buffett, the king of concentrated bets, he still sets limits. Like, did you know that back in 1967, he had a staggering 40% of his entire portfolio in American Express? 40%. You're kidding me. That's putting a lot of trust, a lot of faith in one company, even for someone like Warren Buffett. Right. But remember, this was way back in the day when he was still relatively early in his career, and he was also managing a much smaller amount of money back then. As his wealth grew, as Berkshire Hathaway became the behemoth it is today, he recognized that he needed to diversify a bit more, spread the risk around a little. So even Warren Buffett acknowledges the importance of diversification. Well, at least to some extent. Absolutely. It's all about managing risk, even for the Oracle of Omaha. But to be fair to Buffett, this specific scenario where a single stock balloons to like 40% of your portfolio, it's probably not something most everyday investors really need to stress about. Yeah, that's true. Unless we get incredibly lucky and one of our stocks just like goes through the roof. Exactly. But I think the bigger takeaway here, the underlying principle, is that even the best investors in the world, they're always thinking about how to manage their risk. Risk management. I love it. So we've covered Buffett's three main reasons to sell finding an even more promising opportunity, spotting a fundamental change in a business, and making sure no single stock becomes the 800-pound gorilla in your portfolio. Uh, but what about those times when, you know, we're just not sure? Like, we don't see a screaming buy. We don't see a need to hit the panic button. Is there like a do-nothing zone when it comes to investing? A time to just chill and let your investments do their thing? You know, there really is. It's like that sweet spot between buy more and run for the hills. And it often gets overlooked, you know, with all the noise about active trading and whatnot. It's true, though. There's this, like, pressure to always be doing something. Buying, selling, tweaking. Yeah. It never ends. No kidding. Yeah. And it's easy to fall into that trap, especially with all the financial news and those trading apps that make it so easy to buy and sell at the drop of a hat. But the Swedish investor brings up a really important point. Holding is not the same as buying more, but they are like two peas in a pod. Okay, I'm intrigued. So how do we know when we're in this do-nothing zone? Ah. When it's best to just like 
step away from the buy button. Well, for one, you got to remember every time you sell, even if it's for a nice profit, those capital gains taxes come knocking. And don't forget about those pesky trading fees. Sometimes the most profitable move you can make is actually no move at all. The art of masterful inactivity. Huh? I like it. Right. It's all about taking a deep breath and tuning out that noise. This is where Buffett's advice about emotional detachment really comes into play again. You got to ask yourself, if I didn't already own this stock, would I buy it today, knowing what I know now? If the answer is a resounding yes, then maybe hold your horses and let it ride. Exactly. But if that gut feeling says, hmm, maybe not so much, well, then it might be time to reconsider your position. This has been amazing. So many great takeaways from the Swedish investor and their breakdown of Warren Buffett's wisdom. So just to recap, we've got those three key reasons to consider selling that we talked about. Spotting an opportunity that's just too good to pass up, recognizing when the fundamentals of a business have changed, and of course, making sure none of our stocks become so big they uh, dominate our portfolio. It's like diversifying with a side of opportunity seeking, all while keeping a level head. Couldn't have said it better myself. And then of course, we've got that crucial reminder that sometimes the smartest move is to simply do nothing, let those investments simmer, and resist the urge to fiddle. It's like that old saying, patience is a virtue. It's definitely true in the world of investing. Word. Well, on that note of sage advice, I think it's time to wrap up this deep dive. Big thanks to you. Always a pleasure picking your brain. And to everyone listening, thanks for joining us. Remember, knowledge is power, especially when it comes to navigating the stock market. Until next time, happy investing, everyone.